All right, so I think we're back here. I better check. All right, so a couple things about micrometers before we move on. Hey, Talked about a micrometer. Huh? I need to feed them. Yeah. You gonna record? Okay, this is a zero to one outside micrometer. What does that mean? Can measure from zero to one inch. When you go to the tool room and you want a micrometer, they all have names. They are not called a micrometer. There is a zero to one, a one to two, two to three, three to four, and so on and so forth. If you go to the tool room window, I will warn you now, and you ask for a micrometer, you might just get a micrometer. <laughs> he sent me back today. Did he? Did you ask for a micrometer? Oh, okay. So he's got a very large one back there, and sometimes you will get a micrometer. All right, so we've already covered all this. You guys know how to read the thimble, you know, the sleeve. Um, that's just laid out flat, so you should be able to read that for the test. Uh, this is, should look familiar to you. I've explained the out of round and everything. What? Can you get those answers? There's no answers on there. Can you know? <laughs> Nice try. There is a thing called a veneer caliper. That is what this is, a veneer caliper. Veneer calipers are not appropriate for measuring crankshafts. They're a great machinist tool. Um, I use them more for quick reference. There's veneer dial calipers and, I'm sorry, veneer calipers and dial calipers. I prefer the dial type. They're great for in my shop, we used them for reference work. We actually labeled them with the sticker that said for reference only. We did not calibrate them. In, uh, our, in my shop, micrometers were calibrated at least once a year. So we would uh, not only have calibrated standards, it's called a standard that would go in here, and we would check them against the standard often. But once a year, we would have a guy in a big, big old trailer would show up and he would go through and he'd calibrate every micrometer, recalibrate every standard, and uh, do the whole shop. These we did not do because they just aren't accurate enough. They tend to flex a little bit. Said so they're good for machini machinist work, but not um, what you're supposed to be using for measuring crankshafts and, and aircraft engine parts. Um, let's see, there's your dial caliper. And I'm not gonna take much time on that. All right, so my best friend here, T gauges. And I say that because I don't love T-gauges. I think that they're fine and dandy tool. There are better tools out there. So T-gauges can be very frustrating. But like I said earlier, you guys seem to you, you on? All right. You guys seem to be the best class I have ever had at using a T-gauge. And I'm very serious about that. I'm shocked. Most most yeah, even even I was like, yeah. I don't know what happened. Uh, okay, so um, there's some tricks to using a T gauge. And one of the things, uh, you notice how I got the cylinder set? They set this way. A lot of you guys set them like this, right next to the table, and boy, it doesn't take much. So I set them, set them over this way, okay? Sorry, you can't see over there. All right, so when you're measuring a cylinder, each manufacturer is going to tell you to measure a little bit different. And uh, I'm giving you a continental cylinder with the continental instructions, and you're following that. And really what we're doing, and we're not doing a whole uh, uh, bore inspection. I'm having you do basically one spot. I think I even took the out of round out, didn't I? Okay, so normally I'm going to do one, then an out of round, right? So I'm going to measure here, measure here, here, then here. Take the difference. That's my out of round. Then i got to measure all the way down here. At, at down what would be the bottom when it's facing this way, which is really the top. Um, but I have to measure that because it's going to wear different. If it wears, if I measure it and put it this way, if I measure it and it's angled up like that, it's called choke. And if it goes like that, it's called taper. Now, if you forget that, come up to me. I'll explain it to you. I will grab your neck and I will squeeze and say, when it gets tighter up at the top, it's called choke. And you're like, okay. So I won't do that. It sounds like head on the waiver, I think. All right. So, but I'm not having you worry about that. So I just want you to get the feel for this. 
in the in in a production shop I did not use these I used an inside micrometer which is actually a micrometer that if you would take this part off right here and all that's left is what you guys see it has the carb by tip here and the carb by tip here and you put it in there and as you unscrew it it's calibrated to read something so I would use an inside micrometer and get a perfect measurement I'm going to read it then I'm going to set up a dial bore gauge I think I actually have a picture of yeah, uh, I, I picked this picture because you could see it. Nice tool. But uh, I have these for you. I'm going to teach you how to use them when you get into uh, engine class. But for now, you got to learn the learn the hard way, right? Learn to crawl before you can run. So I'll get an exact measurement. I'll set up a bore gauge. Like I said, doing that, there's no reason why you can't do a set of six cylinders literally in two to three minutes once it's set up. You just do it this way, do it this way, drop it, drop it. You get four measurements. You're done. So. Anyway, when you're doing this, and again, I can't believe I don't hear this out of this class. All the other classes, this is what it sounds like. I'm like, oh, don't do that. It really is bad for them, so don't do it. All right, so what I do, and I'm doing it backwards, is I start with it at an angle. Right, and remember, this is a very three-dimensional thing here. Number one, I've got to get it perfectly perpendicular. I have to get it in the largest part of the cylinder, and if I have it crooked at all, it's going to measure too big, right? So it has to be perfectly parallel and perpendicular, both. It's got to be parallel this way and perpendicular this way. And it's got to be at the largest apex of the cylinder, and it's got to be square. So I usually start off to the sides. So I don't snap it, let it go in the middle. Start crooked, and I measure where this flange is right here. This is the flange. I try and measure exactly in the flange because the book says measure about one inch down. That's about one inch down. So I can easily visualize that. So I will hold one end perfectly where I want it, bring up the other end until it's just in line with the other side. And what happens is when I'm actually pulling it up and it's loose and so I pull it up, it tends to want to center itself all by itself. It finds its own spot in the middle, all right? And so I bring it up until it's my best guess perfectly in line. Everybody follow so far? And then while it's in there, I'll tighten the little spring down, okay, and to take it out gently. But I don't stop there. I always want to stop and do a check. And this is the hard part for me to explain. So to do a check, what I do is I anchor this. I'm going to anchor, anchor the T-gauge towards me, and I'm going to see if I can make it go back through the cylinder. And as I do it, I should, I'm going to wiggle it back and forth through that circle and I'm going to find a spot where it only is barely going to fit through and it just drags a little bit and fits through in one little spot. Follow me? If you did it wrong, what's going to happen is it'll fit anywhere in there. It fits all over the place and you can get it in the middle and go tink, tink, tink on both sides and go, whoa, this is way too small. I didn't do it right. All right, so try it again. Then you put it back in. It's trial and error until you feel it anchor it on one spot. Make it go through, and it should be one little spot where it just barely makes it through and drags through, and then, you, okay, I've got it. And then so bring it out real gently, and then when you measure it with the micrometer, I just tend to hold it like this. And bring it in and use a little clutch on there until just like you would anything else. But you have to be real careful. Sometimes I don't even trust the clutch on these uh, T gauges because the clutch will actually, it's, they're set so tight that it'll start squishing the T gauge. So I bring it up until it just touches it, just a little peck, like you're kissing your sister. And then, <laughs> it's Madagascar, man. It's, it's a children's movie. <laughs> I'll show it to you. So, all right, so just bring it right in and just measure that. Follow? Okay, so for you guys, all you have to do is that one measurement just to get a T-gauge measurement. You don't have to do the out around. You don't have to do the choke. You don't have to do the, do the taper. What's choke? Tight. Yeah, it gets tight. <laughs> Tommy's like, I dare you to put your hand on my throat. <laughs> Good guy. All right, so that's, that's T-gauges. Um, depicted up here are ball gauges. Those are full ball gauges. I like those a whole lot better than what we have, which are... Um, half ball gauges, they're not nearly as accurate. When you're measuring the guides, okay, so this is, this is an aircraft cylinder, right? Maybe I should mention that. All right, aircraft cylinder. We have an intake side and an exhaust side. In past 309s, I've covered all this, but now we're spending more time doing this stuff. I think it's better. This is the intake side. 
The intake side has less cooling, it's a cool side, it has less cooling fins. This is the exhaust side, it has more cooling fins because it's hotter. So that's how you can tell, exhaust, intake. This one just happens to have a square intake, but that, they're not always that way. Then when I look inside, remembering that this is the exhaust side, this is the intake, the exhaust side has a smaller seat. The seat is the hole in there where the, the valve is going to touch. It has a smaller seat. The intake side has a bigger seat. But the opposite is true of the guides. These are the guides where the valve goes up and down inside. Intakes, generally speaking, have smaller guides, and the exhaust has a bigger guide. Now the reason for that is, since we're talking about that, is it's the exhaust side is so hot. So you get extra cooling fins because it's so hot. And um, we want what's called volumetric efficiency. We want when the intake valve opens, the piston is coming down and it's drawing this fuel and air into here. You want the biggest hole you can get because it's sucking it in, right? But uh, when it's time to get rid of all those gases, the intake valve closes and the exhaust opens and the piston literally pushes it out. So you don't need quite as big of an opening, so make a smaller opening. Now the reason why the guides are the opposite, why the exhaust guide is bigger and the intake guide is smaller, is goes back to the heat. So there's so much heat built up on the exhaust side, you want it bigger because there's more surface area. More surface area means that you can transfer the heat out the guide. Intake side, you just don't need it, so they go smaller. Okay, so if you want to get physically technical uh, in physics, yes. But, well, it wants to talk about how the, air, the, the exhaust gas really comes in. You create a low pressure inside of the cylinder, and this, then the external pressure pushes it into, into the low pressure. But, no, I'm saying oh. the exhaust goes out. The exhaust goes out. When the exhaust goes out, it's, it's not the piston that pushes it out. Right? Yeah, it is. It is the Yeah, I thought it was something intake. Yeah, it's piston pushes it out. <laughs> but different glass. Okay, but yes, it is. So anyway, that's how you can do that. Oh, and guides wear funny. They don't like to wear right here where you guys can see it. They wear back down inside here where you can't get to it. So really the proper way to do it is to take your ball gauge, get the right one, you pretty much have to push it in till it's near the bottom, about a quarter inch of a way. Now you can go up from the bottom too, but you can just do it this way, and expand it out until it just drags a little bit, and then drop it that way. Because if it's wearing like this, you're not going to go that way, without bending this. So, because it's like this, you're going to bring it down, oh, about a little less than a quarter inch, three-eighths of an inch from the opening down here, and where it ends, expand it out, drop it through. Always catch it. Follow? All right. So if you can do that, you're on your way. All right, questions about T-gauges? You guys are the T-gauge masters. What else we got going on here? All right. So I think everything else is up here. So we're good. See you later. All right, so I'll post that video so you can watch all this too. Uh, you won't be using this in this class. Uh, <coughs> no, I was trying to think. What, <laughs> I don't believe so. All right, um, so I won't even talk about it. Why waste your time? I don't fill your head with stuff you don't need to know. Feeler gauges. Oh, we'll get into feeler gauges. Oh, I know where we're going now. All right. So that brings us to everybody uh, good on this stuff. If you have more questions, if you're confused, please feel free to ask somebody in the uh, in lab. I, I'm confused. I don't know how to read this micrometer. Uh, what doesn't work so well is uh, show me how to show me how you measured this. <laughs> Hey, now I'm just doing it for you. We're going to talk about torquing now. And before you can understand how to torque something, you have to understand how to determine what size bolt you're using. 
Now I have a couple of things that I say over and over, repeatedly, constantly, hoping that people will absorb them. There's three things, and I forget the other three right now, but the one thing that I always remember, that I always say, and I shall write it, just to show you, Alt-Tab, let's see, go here. This is critical. If you remember one thing, and some of you are on target for this, that's not true. The wrench size is not the bolt size. Now what I mean by that is that the size that's on the wrench is not the bolt size. So the bolt size is not the wrench size. If you have a half inch wrench in your hand and it works on the bolt, do you have a half inch bolt? No. Everybody say no. Okay. <laughs> it is not that way. And I will say this and it's over and over and over. And the reason why it becomes so important and critical is that the and I will show you on charts and stuff, but if you're working on, on an aircraft and you look at it like, oh, I, in fact, this happened. It even happened a few, it hasn't happened lately because I keep saying it over and over again, but I even had a graduating student who came to me in you know, the last few days of class. Kevin, I, you know, I'm putting the prop back on the airplane and it's really squishing the bulkhead. It's this, this uh, piece of aluminum that goes on in front of the prop and the bolts go through it. It's really smashing the heck out of it. And I went out and looked at it, whoa, it really is smashing it. What are you torquing this thing to? Ah, 1,580 inch pounds. Oh my God, why would you do that? Well, I do have a three quarter inch socket. I know, but that's not the, <laughs> size is not the bolt size you're ruining the engine. Uh, so if that happened on a real plane, not one of our exercise planes, that literally means that you would have to probably take the crankshaft off and have it inspected, the prop inspected. And you know what it costs to take a crankshaft out and inspect it? What's a lot to you guys? I don't know. You guys look like a rich crowd. Couple of grand, couple of tens of grands. <laughs> so yes, to disassemble an engine to pull out a crankshaft is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of at least $10,000, assuming nothing is bad. If you had to buy a new crankshaft, it's no problem. They do make them still, and they're usually not much more than starting around 7000 For a 150, to do what? That's about a third of what it costs. <laughs> What's that? When I was doing engine overhauls, and I haven't done them now for almost 15 years. So 15 years ago, the cheapest engine overhaul out of my shop was 20,000. Yeah. yeah. What numbers? The expenses of overhauling an engine and stuff, is there any kind of commission in there where it would be incentivized for us to want to do those? Is there an incentive to you to want to do? Well, yeah. But is there, you get paid more for doing $10,000 worth of work than Same like the bigger the job. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a, an odd question because the more skilled you are, the more you'll make. Uh, and there may be somebody out there paying commission. I, I didn't make commission. The more skilled I was and the more money I made the company, the more money they paid me. So, and that's where a lot of money was being made. Was in, in, but also with great responsibility comes, yeah, not great power. <laughs> What's that from? That's a movie, right? What is it? Spider-Man, thank you, yes. I like that better. But uh, what was it, I, I was saying, quoting, James reason the other day that you know, the greater the responsibility, the higher the mistakes. So uh, the world of engines is not a very forgiving uh, world. So, all right, wrench size is not the bolt size. Um, so remember that. Uh, if you forget it, don't worry, I'll say it again in a little bit. All right, so when we're talking about bolts, there's a couple things we need to know. Um, all right, we're going to get into length and width. So this is a standard aircraft hardware bolt. We call them AN bolts. AN stands for? I don't care what anybody else tells you, it stands for Army Navy. Now they're saying it stands for Air Force Navy. But 
the bolts date back to before the Air Force was founded. So I say it's Army Navy. So A stands for Army Navy. We'll get into that. So anyway, we're going to talk about length. So this is the grip right here. This unthreaded portion is called the grip. And that's really where it's designed to hold stuff, within the grip. That's where you want, if you're bolting something together, it needs to fit within this grip. Aircraft bolts are a lot different than when you go to the hardware store. You can go to the hardware store, you can get threads all the way to the head, you can get threads out here on the end, you can get a uh, big grip, a little grip. Aircraft uh, hardware is not that way. Standard AM bolts are all designed so that there's just enough threads to put one or two washers and a nut on. So, um, as the bolt gets fatter, you're going to get a little bit more threads, but otherwise, see, you, you'll grow your grip, but the threads almost always stay the same. But what we're going to be talking about is the nominal length. Nominal length, and the word nominal is kind of a funny word, not haha, -ha, but what that means is on average, on average length. And the reason why that is is because when they mass produce these, they're not exact. If they are exact, they're very expensive and it's a whole different kind of bolt. But standard aircraft hardware bolts, it's just a nominal length, which means it's about that. It's a certain size plus or minus something, all right? And so uh, if you said you had a one inch bolt, they tried to make it one inch, it's one inch and usually uh, some change, maybe a 32nd of an inch, yeah. What grade bolts do they normally use in aircraft? All right, so. In, a, in automotive SAE, you have grades of bolts, right? And uh, I believe it's a grade five, but it doesn't mark that way. And it's not something that's general knowledge. It's just, it's an A and bolt. Now, the funny thing is they look like grade eight because they're cat plated, okay. but they're not. So I worked with somebody and always say, if you're gonna substitute an aircraft bolt for an automotive bolt, always use a grade eight. I'd say, why? Because they look the same. <laughs> Unless you look at the head, and it's clearly not, and that's how you tell the difference. All right, so. Yeah, all right, so that says Air Force, is that right? No. That's what we say, right? Who cares, really? It's fine. It can be whatever they want it to be. But the AN, so um, I don't want to get too much into hardware. Hardware is, is, is kind of a tricky thing. You're going to get into hardware later, but I need to get you to a point where you can do torquing. And so uh, just know that the nice thing about bolts is they still call them AN bolts, the standard ones. They're, there's different kind of bolts and they're still AN and that's great. And everything used to be an AN and, and it was wonderful and the world was in harmony and uh, I was happy. Uh, but then they didn't like AN so then they went to mil spec. And then mil spec wasn't horrible because the numbers were kind of the same because you know you end up memorizing all these numbers and they go to mil spec and like okay I can kind of cross it in my head for a lot of parts, it was okay because they would just add numbers. Like um, uh, a rivet went from an AN470 to an uh, to an MS2470. Okay, just add 20. I can do that. Um, then they went to an NAS, National Aerospace Standards, and they changed the numbers. And like, all right, I don't know what to do with that. So um, thankfully, it's still AN, so it's kind of talking my language. So in AN hardware, we're talking about bolts. This is an actual part number, an AN 4-20 alpha. All right, the four is going to be the diameter, how fat, how big around it is. So whatever this number is, is the diameter. Then we have a dash, which is gonna be bolt material. It can be a dash, which is gonna be standard. It can be C, corrosion resistant. Um, you can put an H for uh, a hole in the uh, head. Um, we'll get into that later. And then you have a 20 which is the length, this number is always gonna be the length, and then the A, A means absent the hole in the shank, and I'll, I'll talk about that. So, all right, so let's stop with that and go over to here. All right, so A and hardware, so A and, A and bolts. A and bolts. <coughs> kind of going off my head here, let's see. Okay. All right, so the bolts, we'll start with diameter. Diameter is measured 
in sixteenths of an inch. So if I said I had an AN3, what is that? How fat is that? Three sixteenths. If I had an AN4, that's? It's four sixteenths, which is also equal to? One fourth. One fourth. All right, that's just reducing a fraction down. All right, what's the next size, you think? A hand five. Look at that. And that is? Five sixteenths. And then I could go to an AN6. An AN6 is going to be? Six sixteenths, which is also three eighths. You follow? All right, so there's no secret there, right? We could do this all day, couldn't we? AN7 is? Okay, AN8 is? That's, okay, uh, can't, that's about as big as I've ever seen them. I forget offhand what they are. Okay, so that's the diameter. That's not hard, right? Now let's talk length. The length is in eighths, eighths of an inch, okay? It's double, so sixteenth twice that is an eighth. And so if I had an AN4 dash four, I would have a bolt that is how, much, how, how fat, diameter? Four sixteenths, which is also a quarter of an inch. How long is it? It is four eighths, which is also a half inch. Half inch. So if it was an AN four dash five, it would be quarter inch by by five eighths. Not hard, is it? Okay. So I'm going to write it like this. So Kind of starts, about the smallest I've ever seen is three. So three is three eighths. Then it goes four, which is four eighths. Then it goes five, which is five eighths. Then it goes six, which is six eighths. You getting bored yet? Then it goes seven, which is seven eighths. Then it goes, help me out. No. Then it goes to 10. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 10, because 10 equals one inch. <laughs> now you're gonna be happy about this in a minute. All right, so what comes next? An 11, which is one inch and one eighth. A 12 is one inch and two eighths. A 13 is one inch and three-eighths, then a 14 is one inch and four-eighths, and then they have a 15, then we have a 16, then we have a 17, then we have a 20. 20. You guys are catching on. So everybody's going to do me a favor. You're going to go to the tour room, and you're going to ask James, can I please have an AN 4-8? <laughs> and he's going to go, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> That ain't going to work. All right. So we see how that works? All right. Now, the nice thing is when you're torquing, you don't care about the length. The length is not important. What is important is the diameter. And also what is important about the diameter is that the wrench size is not the bolt size. Because, let me think. I don't want to screw this up. Well, a quarter inch bolt, uh, let's do it this way. Let's see how, how well, here's your test. If I have an, if I say I need an AN4, what is my diameter? Four sixteenths, which is equal to what? Four sixteenths, which is equal to what? One quarter. This is my wrench size. Oh, I should have started with a three. Guess what wrench that takes? Three 
7 sixteenths. So 3 is a, that's why I should have started. Uh, 3 is 3 sixteenths, right? And the wrench size on that one is 3 eighths. So an A and 5 is, diameter is what? 5 sixteenths. And the wrench size is half inch. All right, so now we're getting somewhere. I'm just telling you what the wrench size is. Because somebody made it that way. Oh, okay. I can help you out with this. I can help you out with this. Hang on. So let's look at a bolt. The diameter is across here, right? Yes. That's the diameter. Which size wrench does it take? Does it take the same size wrench or a bigger wrench? Bigger wrench to fit on these flats, right? Yes. So if this is an AN4, how big is it across here? Uh, four sixteenths. Four sixteenths or a quarter, inch. Quarter, quarter inch. Do you think the same size wrench is going to fit from here to here? No. What size wrench is going to fit there? Something bigger. Something bigger. <laughs> Experience will tell me that it's a seven sixteenths, but so if I have a seven sixteenths wrench in my hand, is it a seven sixteenths inch bolt? No. no, that's critical that you remember that. All right. What's that? Hey, Dick, that's why you take them all with you and don't worry about it. That's why you buy a crescent wrench. <laughs> all right. So once you figure out, uh, you, you have a question? I just want to kind of confuse as to where you get the 316 to do that. Oh, how did I know the wrench size? Yeah. I've done it enough to know it. Uh, if there was a formula, I've never noticed it, but it could be. Maybe you picked up on something I never noticed. Was it always 3 sixteenths? That was pretty cool that you picked up on that. Nice job. So did you see what he said? He said add 3 sixteenths to this number and you'll always get that number. I hadn't noticed that. Add 3 sixteenths to that, that's that. If we add, ooh, I want to show you something. While we're doing this, got your calculators? Nobody should get calculators out. Today I've got my 30 XA on. We're gonna, I'm not going to have a lot of time to do math, but how do you add 3 sixteenths to 3 sixteenths? That says 31 sixteenths. Sorry, it says 3 sixteenths. If I want to know 3 sixteenths plus a quarter, how do I do that? Remember I told you to cheat? But I said it's not cheating if you're using the tools that are given to you. You're allowed to take this into your FA test. And there's going to be a lot of stuff on there about fractions and adding fractions and math, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things I want to teach you is just how to use your calculator and the buttons that are on here because, hey, sometimes you don't know. If I want to do 3 sixteenths plus 3 sixteenths, check it out. <coughs> Now, this is math for dummies. It should be setting up the uh, thing for dummies. I don't know. Like I said, I don't really love this thing. We're always getting a fight. Okay. Autofocus. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, sorry. Okay. 3 sixteenths. Watch this. 3. See that little ABC button? ABC, 16. Now look at my thing. It says 3 comma 16. Guess what that is? That's 3 16. Plus 3 ABC, 1 6 equals 3 8. If I want to do a quarter plus 3 16, 1 ABC 4 plus 3 ABC 16 equals 7 16. Look at that. He's right. 5 16. So it's 5 ABC 6, oops, uh, back up one, 16 plus 3 ABC 16 equals half inch. Sound like a news station? I was wondering about that is the difference between the diameter and the head. It seems like that might be consistent for some It is consistent, and I had not noticed that. 
I'm going to write that in my notes. Difference is 3 sixteenths. Difference. Can I do that again, how the calculator worked? Yeah. Okay, so to add any fraction, okay, so what's an AN4? How, how, how many sixteenths is it? Four sixteenths. So I don't have to reduce it. I can go four, then that ABC key. Do you have the same calculator? Yeah. Okay, the ABC, and then I hit 16. You see how four comma 16? Uh-huh. All right, plus. And now, and now look, when I hit the plus, see what it did? It automatically made it a quarter inch. So I didn't have to reduce it. Did it all by itself. I hit the plus key. Now I'm going to, so I hit plus, now I'm going to do 3 ABC 16 equals 7 sixteenths. Pretty sweet, huh? Hey, while I'm standing here and I'm doing this, what, what decimal equivalent is 7 sixteenths exactly? 0.187. 0.187, because we already know, everybody should have that memorized, right? I sure as heck don't. See this little key right down here with the arrow on it? Right above it says F, arrows, each way, D. That stands for fraction to decimal. So if I hit this second key, this green key, it's going to activate all the green keys. And now I'm going to come down here to this arrow key, and it's going to go 0.4375, which means that you did not have the right number. You said 0.18 something? Yeah. I just misunderstood. Oh, okay. I understood what you said. So everybody see how to get a decimal out of a fraction? Did you follow? Writing notes. I did, I did leave okay. Five, um, okay, so we had 7 16ths, right? Yeah. And I want to know what decimal that is. I don't want fractions, I want a decimal. Calculator, please show me decimals. <laughs> it's not voice activated. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, so you have a 150 back there? I. I have a voice activated autopilot in my 150, which is actually quite cool. It goes something like this. Katie, take us to an altitude of 2,500 feet with the heading of. <laughs> and it works. It actually it gets there and it does it and it holds it perfectly. Wow. It's probably the most expensive autopilot I've ever had. It talks back. It <laughs> okay. So to get from fraction to decimal, right here there's a little thing that says F to D. It's in green. So it means I have to turn on the green keys. So look up here at the top where it says second. That's in green. Okay? Push that button. And all that happens is it says second right there. Nothing's happened yet. Now I'm going to hit that arrow key, which is, means F to D, which is, stands for fraction to decimal. And it goes 0.4375. That is the decimal equivalent. Now what if I want it to be a fraction? Do it again. Hit the second button, hit the fraction to decimal, and boom, there it is, back to 7 sixteenths. Yes? Okay, compound for like one and a quarter? Okay, and then uh, we'll clear it. You just do it again. So it's one ABC, one ABC, four. So that's one and a quarter. And then decimal would be 1.25. 1.25, let's prove it. So second fraction decimal, 1.25. That is what math class is going to be like with me. <laughs> All right, we're going, to we're going to learn how to do stuff on our calculator. And now remember, when we talk about math, there's multiple ways to do math. There's different paths, you know. I'm always going to default to idiot math. Or you can call it Kevin math. I don't care because it's the math that works for me in, in, in my brain. Because I'm a mechanic. I'm not a mathematician. So I'm going to do what's quick and easy and works every time. Maybe I will take an extra step, but if I can do the same step on every single kind of problem and get, and so I don't have to worry about it, I'm happy. You got, who, who likes word problems? Nobody? Okay, I, Evan back there. When we get to word problems, I am gonna show you a simple formula to solve every single FAA word problem there is. When I show you this, you're gonna be like, it's so stupid, it's easy. How can you do that for every single FA problem there is? Because I had to figure it out, right? <laughs> so don't worry about that. We're going to get through that. Anyway, back to this. Um, back to this. Well, we don't have a lot of time left, but let's just finish what we can. So uh, back to 
the computer up here on the screens. Because the people at home, you're just watching the computer the whole time. Now, what's he talking about? All right. Um, okay. So the diameter of the bolt is critical. That's what's going to determine our torque. Not only the diameter, but the threads per inch. How many threads it has. So when I come down here and I look at this, bolts have a particular thread pitch to them. And that's how many threads per inch there are. And, and really you could kind of lump it into there's fine thread bolts, which means there's a lot of threads per inch, and there's coarse thread bolts, which not so many threads per inch. Most all aviation bolts are fine thread, almost all of them. Uh, unless you're working on a light combing engine, which uses all coarse thread, everything else uses fine thread. It is so rare to see a coarse thread, it's like, wow, that is just really odd, like a coarse thread bolt. Somebody probably brought it at the hardware store. Yeah. <laughs> or it's a light combing. Yeah? What, what would be your definition of like, a fine thread? Would, would that be one? Yeah. No. Well, oh, the nice thing is, you don't have to worry about my definition. The FAA is going to define it for you. Would you look at that? Okay, so this is a chart out of AC4313. Now, I'm going to leave you with this. We're going to pick up here tomorrow. AC4313 is an advisory circular. Is it approved data? No. no. So it's acceptable. So this becomes a last resort. You had better look in the appropriate airframe manual first you had better look in the appropriate engine manual first. Because let me tell you right now, if you torque something on an engine to this chart right here, you screwed up bad. And I mean real bad. And you don't want to do that on an engine. But we're going to be working with this chart because it's a universal chart. So with that in mind, don't go away, man. Just go away. Just go away. <laughs> don't go away, man. Just go away.